Hello and welcome to the NC podcast. My name is Natasha Collins and I am the founder of NC Real Estate, which includes its members club for landlords and property investors to build a profitable property portfolio that completely aligns with their goals. This week, I have a super exciting guest. I have got David Hunt here with me. Hi, David. Hi, Natasha. So we know each other through working together at UCM. You teach on valuations, I teach on property management, right? Yeah, we sat together for a while and now you've, now you've moved off. <laughs> <laughs> and we would have the best conversations about our property investments rather than sitting there doing I guess the doing any actual doing any actual work yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and so I wanted to bring David on today one to talk about valuations but two to also talk about your property portfolio and what you've been building as well um, because I think it's an interesting conversation to listen to it from a surveyor in the industry and also someone who is building a property portfolio so should we start from the yeah. very beginning and talk about your career path to date and then we can jump into your investments from there uh, yeah I mean um, it's nothing nothing terribly unusual in my final year of school I, I spoke to you know, many people in different professions. I think actually, I really actually wanted to join the military, but it didn't quite work out for me that way. Um, my father put me in touch with some surveyors he knew to talk to, as he you know, thought that was the career that he wished that he had followed, that he had pursued. And I, I think I went into uh, various offices in Glasgow to meet them over a coffee and ask about their job. And I wasn't actually sure about what a surveyor does uh, the, the various property industry roles seem to overlap with a, that, you know, whether it's a person uh, mapping the, the ground of the theodolite or valuing a house or project managing a build, building site. I, I wasn't so sure. I mean, everybody knows what an architect does, but and everyone maybe has heard the term chartered surveyor, but the word, the, you know, that phrase is so broad that it, it could mean so many things. And, um, I think well, at the time in the late 90s, there wasn't such a, a degree of specialisation in the industry. And most surveyors at the time, they, they would have been, they would have described themselves as general practitioners working in small traditional partnerships. Uh, they might deal with agency one day, rating another day, valuation on a property management. And I mean, speaking to the, speaking to these people. Well, what appealed to me was the fact that I would be in an office all day. I didn't mm -hmm. want to be just stuck, you know, a computer. Uh, but you'd actually get to go out and say, you go to uh, client offices or go to inspect properties. And it is kind of thinking about, as I'm saying this, I realise that my job at the university is mostly sitting in a, an office all day and I don't really have that opportunity to go out on site. Um, what else did I do? I went to local university, actually, to speak to one of the, the lecturers or one of the professors, and uh, they tried to, they have, it wasn't an open day, it was actually a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Mm -hmm. And they stressed that, that the subjects also that they teach or did teach at the time were part, as part of their bachelor's degree in real estate management meant that you learn many other useful business skills, uh, computing, statistics, construction, project management, law, um, and not just pure surveying so I thought that degree would be good broad qualification um, as well as being you know specialized as and vocational mm -hmm. and uh, what was important about it is that that degree offered a one-year work placement uh, which I spent with a, a small traditional firm of surveyors doing mostly residential valuations for home buyers but also uh, I had some exposure to agency work I let a small shop uh, I had to do a lot of probate valuations, um, sort of inheritance tax valuations, um, and rating and assessment. And then after graduation, I got a job with uh, with the government in the, the valuation office agency. And that takes me up to, to uh, uh, graduation, just post-graduation. And then from there, you've had a bit of a varied career where you've worked all over the EU, you now do global talks with the universities. So tell me about that. Uh, yeah, well, that's that's the, the real perk of the job. That's the real um, exciting part of the job is the, the business trips, uh, the travel. I, I always had the idea to work abroad. 
um, out of a sense of travel, uh, travel adventure. Mm-hmm. You know, visiting a country only gives you so much the idea of a place. You have to live there, learn the language. You, you know, I, I taught English as part of a university project, a uh, summer project as a, a volunteer in 1999. I taught English in Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, back at the time when that region was still developing, um, it really was a, a frontier place. There were no budget airlines. You needed a visa to visit some of these countries back then. These are countries that are now in the European Union. But back then, you, some of them, you needed you need to go to the embassy <laughs> and get a visa before you went there. And uh, also, I didn't know many people that had been to these places. Um, so that was a sort of a sense of... Uh, sort of the exciting, the unknown. And then, you know, around 2004, 2005, I was keen to move. I'm working in England. Uh, I wanted to expand my horizons. Where I was didn't have many opportunities for what to do after you become chartered, or you get become a qualified uh, valuation surveyor, in, in my case. And... Uh, you know, I looked around at jobs in Western Europe and most of the time in that, that period of time seemed to want you to know the language. If you wanted to work in the Paris office, you needed to speak French. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to work in uh, Frankfurt, you needed to know German. And it's not necessarily like that now, you know, 15 years uh, further on. Uh, but at that time, further further east, this was not a problem. So uh, I applied for some roles. I actually wanted to work in Budapest. I went to all the big firms there. And uh, one of them, I spoke to one of them, the sort of head of the, that region, and they were a bit like, oh, I might be in London in six weeks' time. Can you come down and maybe we can do something then? It's basically phone interviews. But that same, that same, uh, uh, he was a director of the company, he'd, he'd gone to some international event where he met the the head of the, the their Kiev office in Ukraine. And they were desperate for somebody because no, Ukraine wasn't a really appealing place to go. Nobody really knew much about Ukraine mm-hmm. at that time. And, you know, he phoned me up and said, can I come out this weekend? <laughs> oh, no, I said, well, it's a bit too soon. Okay, well, what about the following weekend? <laughs> so they just flew me out and I spent two days seeing the apartment I would stay in. And being shown around the office, being taken around the city, seeing the nightlife and saying, look, you're not going to be on your own out here. We've got a nice community and that. And uh, I, I couldn't really couldn't really say no. And, you know, I think one of the perks about, you know, going to a, a developing country as uh, a young professional is that you, you can often leapfrog in, in rank. Mm-hmm. So I became from a, a severe to a newly chartered severe, I became senior severe. Or a senior surveyor could, you know, step up to associate, uh, associate partner, associate director. So that was that was also a, a huge appeal. Yeah. Um, and uh, I spent almost four years in that country. Mm-hmm. Um, and being 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 in a, a sort of a, a small office and being a sort of token foreigner, or being that token foreigner, being the only for, I, I got to get involved in everything. So if a, if, a, if a Scandinavian client came in wanting property management services, I was wheeled out to sit in the meeting and give a sort of a spiel about the development opportunities in that country. Or if somebody came, uh, if somebody from Spain came wanting to buy shopping malls, then it would be the same. We'll just get the, the native English speaker out to do it. So I got to deal with that, 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 that pitching side of things, that business side of things building a rapport. These were skills that I'd never really learned in the public sector with the valuation office agency. And they, that, that was a, 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 a fantastic place to learn. And of course, there's other, you know, other advantages. I got to, I got to do work in Kazakhstan. I got to do work in Russia. I went to, I used to go to Russia, um, you know, fairly, fairly frequently at one time. Um, being a small expat community, I got to know, everybody at the, the, the British Embassy or the, the Canadian Embassy or the US Embassy and get invited to a lot of social events and meet ambassadors. And uh, I met I met the, the, f- the first uh, US Secretary of Homeland Security just there, a man called uh, Tom Tom Ridge. Just just met him at a, a party. I met, I met the old Spanish Prime Minister. 
at, uh, at one of these these events. I uh, met a uh, Swedish Swedish king and wow. uh, um, a Dutch prince. Uh, these sort of things just by being there. So I got to fly in a, a private jet with uh, clients, uh, a merchant, a famous New York based merchant bank flew me around the country in a, a, a private jet to show some schemes that they were thinking of investing in. So that, well, that was something that, you know, I'll never, I'll never get that time back. Um, and then that, that's at the end. Uh, well, later on, I worked in, uh, Worked in Romania, worked in Poland. I've done valuation work in the all over the Balkans, uh, everywhere from maybe Latvia down to Slovenia to Bulgaria. So I've got to I got to go visit quite a lot of countries as well. And uh, I think what you asked something about talks. That's something that I've had come to do since moving to the uh, university, mm-hmm. where I got the chance to uh, uh, prepare you know CPD type classes for developing. More markets as part of us you know staying in touch with our alumni as well as trying to recruit new students I've had the opportunity to to, to uh, go to Africa a couple of times and I've also I've also you know when working in education uh, what we remember we've got we've got years and years and years of work experience and we're now being taught how to talk mm-hmm. and how to teach that uh, I've been asked to do some private uh, training as well in Central Europe, and uh, a couple of other irons in the fire, so to speak. But I'm just not sure how to make make it all work. Uh, I guess you know we have students from all over the world, mm-hmm. and many of them say, "Hey, I saw what you did in Nigeria. Can you can you come out to Uganda and do the same? Can you come out to Zambia and do the same?" Uh, another one was Malawi. So I just have to try and find a way <laughs> to to join all these these dots together and I'll get to get to hopefully go out and see these countries also amazing so just through property for everybody who's listening David has had to have has had this amazing experience of being all the way through Europe traveling in the world and that continues so that's awesome so then let's talk about what goes on closer to home so you also have your own investment portfolio. So can you tell us about your strategy and what type of investor you are? Um, I, I start off, I've never been that self-reflective, but I would, I would definitely say that I was cautious. I've seen several crashes, property crashes. During my teenage years, there, was, uh, there were lots of people in the UK suffering from this problem of negative equity, a term that we heard, heard a lot often in the news and on TV, but I didn't, didn't quite fully understand until I was older. And this was a huge 1990s crash, and that was maybe a, a lesson uh, to me that my goal, uh, that's informed my strategy. And that's always been to save a deposit, mm-hmm. buy a property. Nowadays, I guess it's uh, 25% of the property value. Uh, with a 75% loan and then take uh, what I've done recently is take a two-year term then use all the income from that uh, not to live off not to spend uh, for as long as I'm working anyway um, I use all that income to overpay um, that mortgage to try and pay down the capital mm-hmm. um, the idea being to try and get that mortgage to a, a 60% loan to value over two years, I have to put in some other cash as well. And uh, the, the the strategy was after two years to renegotiate that mortgage with the benefit of a, a lower rate, and thus, thus spreading that profit margin. Um, the idea being based uh, that all the loans I've had, is common in the UK anyway, that you, you can overpay up to 10% of that outstanding loan amount each year. Now, uh, a couple of things was that, that I mean, that logic was fine until, well, some say the vote to leave the European Union, but arguably it was uh, before that, when the, it was when this uh, 3% property duty, I think it was mm-hmm. the 3% property duty, it was after it, and the, the new tax rules on offsetting interest payments, after, after that came in, um, it sort of skewed the market a little bit 